Hey everyone, welcome back to Pete's Behavioral Insights and Theories, aka Pete's Bits. Before we get started with today's video, I just want to say an enormous thank you for the amazing support on the channel. The first video last week got over 700 views within the first few days, and over 100 of you have already subscribed to this channel, and the support has been phenomenal. So I just want to say an enormous thank you, and for those of you who have not yet subscribed, if you needed some social proof that subscribing to this channel was a good idea, then you have all the social proof you need right there. Please join over 100 like-minded behavioral science enthusiasts by clicking that big red subscribe button below this video. All right, thank you guys for watching, and I hope you enjoy the video. So today I want to talk a little bit about self-control, because I think it's a topic in behavioral economics which is often misunderstood, and therefore it's overlooked in its significance in changing people's behavior. So I hope by the end of this video I can convince you that the true nature of self-control is actually one that is quite counterintuitive, and actually understanding the true counterintuitive nature of self-control is something which will help you in your day-to-day -day life as well as being able to help many other people. So we're gonna explore this topic of self-control through a few key studies. Now, this wouldn't be a discussion about self-control if we didn't mention the marshmallow experiment. So Walter Michelle and Ebb Ebsen from Stanford University conducted this extremely famous and extremely adorable psychology experiment called the marshmallow experiment. And the main paradigm for this experiment worked as follows. They got a bunch of four-year-old children to be participants. The children were placed in a room with a marshmallow on a plate. And the children were told, hey, I'm gonna leave the room for a while. Um, and if you want, you could eat that marshmallow. However, if you wait 15 minutes for me to come back, then you can actually have two marshmallows. And what the experimenters were testing here was what they called delayed gratification. It's would the children be able to wait the full 15 minutes in order to obtain the much better reward, the two marshmallows. And this experiment was also repeated with other treats too, like animal crackers and pretzels, with very similar results. So as you can see from the footage on screen now, Four-year-old children really, really struggle to wait 15 minutes for the second marshmallow. They don't have much to do when left in a room alone with a marshmallow, and as expected, the majority of the children couldn't wait the 15 minutes and they ate the marshmallow. In fact, the results from their study showed that 75% of children would eat the marshmallow and not obtain the better reward. But what's interesting is what about those 25% of children who didn't eat the marshmallow? It appears that those children have better self-control and therefore you might predict that those children would do better in life later on as a result of them having higher self-control. Well, that's exactly what the authors found. Follow-up work on those children who took part in the study showed that those who were able to resist the marshmallow had higher test scores in school, they did better on the SAT, and they even had lower BMIs when they got to adulthood. So what this initial study suggested was that self-control was an enduring characteristic, which acted as a strong predictor of really positive long-term life outcomes. Now this idea was further supported later on by another famous psychologist, Roy Baumeister and his colleagues. Now Roy Baumeister and his colleagues developed a self-control scale for people to actually measure their self-control. And in their work with this scale, they showed that people who scored higher on the self-control scale had more retirement savings, had more regular sleep times, were generally more successful, and they even had happier relationships with their partners. So certainly it seems that self-control is an incredibly powerful and enduring characteristic for us to possess. But the story of self-control actually gets really interesting when you look at those people who are performing well in self-control. When we look at those people who have high self-control, what is it that they are actually doing to be able to achieve all of these long-term life outcomes? And it's not what you might think. You see, the marshmallow experiment is often misinterpreted by articles and media about it because people only focus on the one condition, the main condition when the child had the marshmallow on a plate in front of them and they had to wait a full 15 minutes looking at that marshmallow. When in fact, the original marshmallow study wasn't just testing that, but actually had a few other conditions too. And the other condition that I wanna draw your attention to was when the marshmallow was not on a plate in front of them, but instead put away and hidden in a cake tin so it wasn't in sight of the children. Now you remember when the marshmallow was in front of the children that 75% of the children failed to wait the full 15 minutes and obtain the better reward. But what's interesting about this second condition is that just by simply putting the marshmallow out of sight and in a cake tin, now 75% of the children succeeded in waiting the full 15 minutes and were able to get that better reward. So you see what the marshmallow experiment was really testing was actually the power of the situation in people's ability to maintain high self-control. By removing the marshmallow from the children's vision, they were much more successful at resisting it and therefore were able to achieve the long-term better 
outcome. Now I'm sure the cogs in your brain are already turning about how this applies to real life and even adult human behavior. And indeed this idea has been backed up by other researchers too. If you've heard of Angela Duckworth, she's a really famous psychologist known for her work on grit. But actually the majority of Angela Duckworth's work is actually about self-control. And in a paper about self-control that she wrote with two other authors, Angela Duckworth highlighted this hiding the marshmallow idea as situation modification. It's things that we can do to remove the temptation from our lives in order to make the healthier, correct behavior easier to carry out. Examples of situation modification that you can use today might include putting your smartphone in a drawer or out of reach of you when you're trying to do some productive work. In essence, your smartphone is a distracting stimulus just like the marshmallow, and by simply putting it out of sight or out of reach, you're far more likely to adhere to the desired productive work that you're trying to do. Another great example is if you attend lectures or classes, perhaps you want to sit closer to the lecturer or the teacher at the front of the class and away from those uh, rowdy classmates of yours who maybe don't focus as well as they should do. By sitting closer to the front and with peers who like to focus, you're far more likely then to focus even on the most boring of lectures. Because social proof is such a powerful idea in behavioral science, we tend to mimic the behavior of those around us. You can, um, for you psychologists out there, you might think back to Bandura and his dolls, is that people are very good at mimicking the behavior of those around us. So just by sitting with people who focus, you're creating this symbiosis of excellent students who are able to really concentrate on the class. And obviously the converse is true, is if you're with the slackers who sit towards the back. So as you can see, those people who are exerting self-control aren't doing it in the way that we typically think. You might typically think that self-control is an exercise of willpower. You think that self-control might be the act of forcing yourself to do things that you don't want to do, and it's just a hardcore white knuckle resistance to temptation. But the prevailing research in self-control studies show that this isn't what high self-control people do. Instead, they're living their life in a way where they manipulate their situation in order to remove the temptation entirely. They're removing the temptation to behave in a poor way so that behaving in the correct healthy way is easy. And that's what true self-control looks like. And instead, people who rely on exerting their willpower and their executive control in order to accomplish healthy tasks are actually the ones who perform very poorly in those tasks in the long run because that isn't a sustainable way to achieve your long-term goals. You have to manipulate your situation, not try and exert more willpower. So how do these people do it? How do these people manipulate their situation in such a consistent way in order for them to achieve their long-term goals? Well, research by Wendy Wood and her colleagues seems to indicate that high self-control people are utilizing good habits. And in order to illustrate this point, I want to show you an amazing study that was carried out by Wendy Wood, Peying Lin, and John Monteroso, which has become known as the M&M and Carrot Study. So this study was investigating how habits affect people's healthy choices, and it consisted of three phases. The first phase was the training phase. Participants were starved for a short while so that they were really, really hungry, and then they were brought into the lab and they were taught to play this game. And in the game, they would move a joystick down to the bottom of the screen to where there was a picture of carrots. And once they completed this task of moving the joystick down, the game would dispense a snack of carrots and they would enjoy the carrots to help them with their hunger. Now, once they'd repeated this training phase a few times, a habit quickly formed. So as soon as the game came up, they would automatically move the joystick down and obtain the carrots very quickly without really thinking about it. But then they changed the experiment to the second phase. Now in the second phase, the same interface showed up. The hungry participants would come in, they could move the joystick down to get their carrots, but now there was a new option. Now there was a picture of M&Ms at the top, and presumably if they move the joystick to the M&Ms, they would also have M&Ms dispensed to them. Now I don't know about you, and as much as I like carrot sticks, the choice between M&Ms and carrot sticks, M&Ms definitely would usually win for me. However, because those participants had gone through that training phase and they developed that habit of moving the joystick down to the carrots, even when the M&Ms were available to them, the majority of participants, over 60%, still chose the carrots. So that goes to show you that just having good habits in place means that we'll engage in the healthy behaviors even when the unhealthy options are available to us, we won't consider them and we'll just rely and fall back on our habits that we established, which were healthy and good for us. But for me, I think the most interesting part of this study was the third phase, and that's when they changed the game again. In this third phase, the game worked in a similar way, except now the carrots weren't at the bottom of the screen, but instead they were on the left and the M&Ms were on the right. 
So this change in position of the carrots acts as a discontinuity in the habit that was already formed. The habit was to move the joystick down to obtain the carrots, but now the participant had to think about how to obtain the carrots again, and now they had to move the joystick to the left. And the interesting finding is, now instead of the majority of the participants choosing the carrots, most of them now go for the M&Ms. So this is perhaps the most counterintuitive idea about self-control that I wanted to talk to you about today. So if you made it this far in the video, congratulations, you made it to the really juicy part about the video. So this part of the study is fascinating to me because it goes against what we traditionally think of as good self-control interventions in behavioral science. Because typically in behavioral science, you might think that more top-down executive function, system two for you Kahneman fans out there, is what's going to help us make the healthier choices and resist temptation. But the carrot and M&M study, as well as many others, suggests that this isn't the case. In fact, it's when we are engaging our system too, when we're engaging this executive function and have to consider our decisions, that's when we're actually more subject to temptation, and instead the best practice for making consistent, healthy choices and achieving those long-term goals is actually just to fall back on our good habits. So if I had to sum up the lessons from this video in three points, here's what it would be. The first is that self-control seems to be responsible for us being healthier, wealthier, and happier. And so because I assume that you want to be all of those things, perhaps you should be paying more attention to how self-control is being utilized in your life. The second point is that self-control isn't really about willpower like we typically think it is. Instead, what the research consistently shows is that those people who seem to have high self-control are doing so by manipulating their situation in a way that sets them up for success. And conversely, those people who rely on willpower in order to achieve their long-term goals are the ones who tend to fail the most often. And thirdly, and perhaps most interestingly for behavioral scientists, is that self-control is best achieved when the process is automatic. If you want to live healthier, happier lives, you should be focusing on establishing good habits. If you want to make more healthy choices more often, then make that healthy choice your go-to default and you'll make the correct decision more often. All right, thank you for watching today's video. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. If you did, please can you give this video a like and don't forget to subscribe. And maybe you wanna ring that notification bell next to the subscribe button so that you don't miss out on any of the behavioral science content that I'm making for this channel. Now I wanna give full credit where credit is due. I wasn't the one who carried out this research. I'm merely an aficionado and disseminator of this information. A lot of the information for this video came from Wendy Wood's book, Good Habits, Bad Habits, and a chapter called What About Self-Control? The book only came out recently and it's one of my favorite behavioral science books that I've read this year. So if you're looking for a behavioral science book recommendation that isn't just nudge or thinking fast and slow for the 150th time, I highly recommend Wendy Wood's Good Habits, Bad Habits. I'll have a link to it in the description. Not sponsored, I just think it's amazing. And if you have any comments about the points that I make in this video, please leave that in the comment below and I'll be in the comment section furthering the discussion with you. All right, thank you again for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.